A worship song written by my friend Merla Watson goes like this. It's the end of the Gentile age when we must start to turn the page and shun all our pagan ways. We must flow with a new thing God said he'd do. It's time to grab the tallit of the Jew. A tallit is a prayer shawl, and when worn over the shoulders, it resembles the wings of a bird. Zechariah 8.23 prophesies that when Jesus returns during his thousand-year rule, ten men from all the nations will grasp the wing of a Jew's garment, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. The nations clinging to the fringes of the Jewish prayer shawls is the very opposite attitude of anti-Semitism and certainly does not describe the present increasingly anti-Israel attitude of the world at large. Despite the increasing irrational anti-Semitism of our day, the Bible predicts that God plans to restore the kingdom to Israel. Jerusalem will become the worship capital of the world when Jesus returns. And if you have eyes to see, the transition is already on the horizon. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. Zechariah 8.23 prophesies that ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard God is with you. God plans to restore his favor to Israel. Anti-Semitism will be a hateful thing of the past in the future millennial kingdom when Jesus returns and separates the sheep nations from the goat nations. Meanwhile, as Jesus prepares to evacuate his bride, the body of Messiah of all true believers worldwide, The church age is winding up. Politicians are failing. They're gaslighting the public and offering no real strength of leadership. Shockingly, but really not surprising, according to a new report by two independent monitoring groups, the UN-run schools for Palestinians are still publishing materials that glorify terrorism and demonize Israelis. The latest offending publications carry the logo of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, known as UNRWA, whose $1.6 billion budget is largely funded by Western citizens from the USA and the UK. In fact, the United Nations has gone so far as to officially declare Israel's rebirth as a nation in 1948 as a catastrophe. The UN General Assembly passed a resolution to commemorate the Nakba. That's an Arabic word meaning the day of catastrophe. Meanwhile, an article from the news site Harbinger's Daily says belief in God and holding a biblical worldview are nearing extinction in America. Every genuine believer wants revival and fresh moves of the Holy Spirit because, need I remind you, Holding biblical perspectives in Western nations has declined to a disturbing historic low. Researcher George Barner rightly says that people don't accidentally go through life and suddenly acquire a biblical worldview. No, it takes commitment and intentional purpose to develop biblical thinking. Dr. Barner's new study shows fewer people believe in one true God, Thus, the Bible has less influence since Barner began measuring biblical worldview in the early 1990s. Dr. Barner said an obvious concern is young people have almost non-existent godly influences in their lives, noting that Americans are raising the most defiant anti-Christian kids who are aggressively rejecting biblical principles in our culture. So if fewer and fewer people look at the world through a biblical lens, 
This is the prophesied end time apostasy. There was a time when the majority of the population in Britain and America held a biblical worldview. But apostasy is prophesied to be intense and to escalate exponentially in the end times, just as we're seeing. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Paul called the deterioration of society the apostasy, the rebellion, or the falling away. He prophesied that some will depart from the faith. And as England has gone, America is quickly also going. England has undeniably devolved into a post-Christian society. At the Queen's coronation in 1952, the sovereign was presented with a Bible, which was called, quote, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. But now, in the final hours of the dispensation of the church age, many who profess to have a relationship with God will only be living a lie, religious frauds. Dignity is one of the hallmarks of divine influence on a society. But tragically, our fashion, art, and architecture have become increasingly ugly, bizarre, and banal. Evolution says mankind is nothing special, just another animal. It's so tragic to see the country of my youth in ruins. An Arab Christian friend in Jerusalem recently visited the USA, but he said he had to run away from America because of what he described as the insane stuff happening with transgender pronouns and drag queens invited into kindergartens to entertain toddlers. The good news is that this end time apostasy indicates, thankfully, Jesus is right at the door. The prophet Daniel predicted that many of the biblical prophecies, which were sealed until the time of the end, would finally become unsealed. And in our technological age, with the rise of artificial intelligence, it's much easier to understand events foretold in the book of Revelation. But for those who are fervently praying for revival and who are not particularly watching for the Lord's imminent appearing, I can assure you that the Word of God says there will be a great revival during the tribulation period due to the fact that God will seal 144,000 Jewish and Israelite evangelists. And these preachers of righteousness will be untouchable. Also, the Lord will bring out His big guns, His two witnesses, most likely, scholars say, to be Moses and Elijah whose supernatural ministries are described in Revelation chapter 11. Multitudes will receive a saving knowledge of the Lord during the seven-year tribulation period. But these new believers will be martyred for their faith because the future Antichrist dictator and his global system will not tolerate allegiance to God. Like John the Baptist the two fiery witnesses will preach repentance and judgment, and they will be dressed in sackcloth, demonstrating their supernatural powers, authority, and immunity. According to Revelation 11, 5 and 6, nobody will be able to harm them or arrest them until their mission is complete, when God will allow them to be killed to demonstrate the baseless hatred of the world against truth. And when the two witnesses are killed, the earth dwellers will celebrate by sending gifts to one another, rejoicing that the two witnesses are finally silenced. But according to Revelation 11, 12, three and a half days after they are killed, God will resurrect the two witnesses and rapture them to heaven while the whole world looks on via TV and internet. You may wonder, will people be so wicked that they will actually celebrate the death of the two prophets and send gifts to one another? Unfortunately, yes, because this is the state of the hearts of mankind that even now we see happening. Every time an Israeli is killed by a terrorist, 
Many Palestinians rejoice in the streets, shooting off guns into the air and celebrating the deaths by passing out gifts of sweets and pastries to one another. Avner Bosky, an Israeli believer with Davis Tent Ministry, wrote a recent newsletter entitled, A Person's Enemies Are the People of His Own Household in which he said a Greek tragedy is playing itself out in Israeli politics, one that's essential to understand for those who want to grasp the dynamics of current events for prayer. One of the deeply saddening manifestations in today's Israeli society is the increased social tension, hatred, and fear that Jewish people are displaying towards each other. Yes, even Jews in the Promised Land, who were once united for survival, are separating from each other, even cursing each other and treating one another like enemies, Avner wrote. Politicians especially are treating their fellows with disdain, mockery, derision, and contempt. The heated nature of exchanges on social media is disturbing. Avner wrote that the Israeli social pot is in imminent danger of boiling over. So now is the time to pray for the healing of wounds, the melting of anger, the onset of repentance, and the establishment of righteousness and justice in the land. Let's also remember that a day is coming when all such divisions in Israel will be removed by the God of Israel. Ezekiel 37 in verses 21 to 23, declares why. This is what the Lord of hosts says. Behold, I am going to take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Whose land? It it says into their own land, the Jewish land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. It doesn't say the mountains of Israel. Palestine, it says the mountains of Israel, and one king will be king for all of them, prophesying of Messiah. And they will no longer be two nations, and they'll no longer be divided into two kingdoms. In other words, there's not going to be the two kingdoms as in the past of Judah and Israel, but just one nation named Israel. And they will no longer defile themselves with their idols or with their detestable things or with any of their offenses. But the Lord says, I will rescue them from all of their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. Hallelujah. Clearly, these wonderful prophetic verses are playing out now, and they portend that God will do a major powerful work in truth, righteousness, justice and redemption to a presently divided Israel. And I believe intercession is increasing among believers worldwide for Israel. Just the other day, my husband and I were having breakfast in Jerusalem with an Indian pastor who remarked that he knows of believers in India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and other parts of Asia who are hungry for the Hebraic roots of our faith And they're praying fervently for the kingdom of God to be restored to Israel. At this present time, it's vitally important for believers to develop sharp powers of discernment. The Bible clearly states that the last days will be an age of deception. Things are not always as they appear, of course. Sugar is not salt and salt is not sugar, but they look the same. And while I'm not a Roman Catholic, I do care about the 1.3 billion persons worldwide who claim to be Catholics. They look to the Pope for spiritual answers. But in a recent interview to mark his 10th year anniversary, Pope Francis for a second time denied the existence of hell, saying that hell is not a place, but simply, quote, a state of the heart. End quote. The pontiff's remarks were made in a lengthy conversation with an Argentinian news site. But his recent remarks echoed similar remarks he previously made in a controversial interview with an atheist journalist 
named Eugenio Scalfari, in which Scalfari claimed that Pope Francis denied the existence of hell and had argued instead that lost souls are simply annihilated upon death. The Vatican tried to do damage control, saying the Scalfari interview had been disclosing only private discussions. But the Pope's recent comments, again denying the existence of hell, repudiate the Catholic Church's teaching as well, of course, as the teachings of Jesus himself in the Gospels. For example, in Luke 16, it's not just a parable about hell. Jesus spoke of real human beings a beggar named Lazarus who was saved and went to paradise. And verse 19 says there was a certain rich man who went to hell, not because he was rich, but because he died in an unrepentant state. And in hell, the man is tormented both physically and mentally. Jesus taught that the damned will realize where they are in hell and the damned will forever have unspeakable remorse, while across a great gulf they will have a clear view of the happiness of heaven. So also in St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus spoke of Judgment Day and the separation of the righteous from the unrighteous, who shall go into, he said, everlasting punishment. And in yet another discourse with his disciples, in Matthew 13, 41, Jesus explained the parable of the sower, comparing it to the final days of judgment. He said, The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The church fathers and theologians throughout the history of the church, have understood Jesus' depiction of hell as being a literal, physical place. And so the nondescript definition of hell by Pope Francis is a departure from Scripture and a clear contradiction of Scripture. I've said repeatedly that our times call for believers to develop maximum discernment and to be biblically correct, not politically or culturally correct, we mustn't try to water down the contents of the New Testament just to try to please people. But a Christian author recently admitted that churchgoers are fearful of offending people so much that they don't speak the truth that will save people. But we are to love our neighbors. And how can we do that full of grace and full of truth if we truly love people, we'll tell them the truth. Furthermore, According to LifeSite News, Pope Francis' new Mayan rite of the Mass is a so-called Trojan horse of pagan worship and is on the brink of being unleashed to the entire Catholic world. Born out of Francis' synod on the Amazon, it reportedly glorifies pagan practices. There are links on the internet, such as this one from Harvard University, including quotes from a paper entitled protest against Pope Francis's sacrilegious acts, condemning the Pope's dabbling into idolatry. I'd say that discernment 101 for a believer, and of course I'm speaking of born-again persons infilled by the Holy Spirit, for them discernment 101 is the need to learn to trust the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Some Bible teachers and theologians describe the inner witness of the Holy Spirit as a gut feeling or an inner alarm, a cautionary light. Besides having been given a conscience by God, this inner warning system, this red light of the Holy Spirit protects us from deception. If we will train ourselves, of course, to listen to it. The problem is many believers who are not mature may tend to override the inner witness. They may ignore the still small voice inside them, alerting to the fact that something's not right. As I've been pointing out in many previous programs, the last days are predicted in the Bible to be a time of seducing spirits and great deception that would deceive, if possible, even the elect. So we have to be on high alert 
and very diligent. After all, we're surrounded by it. There's so much deception going on 24-7 in the media, night and day, and on the internet. And as for preaching, we have to listen carefully to teachings and make sure that what we're hearing is truly biblical. So don't override any feelings of unease or any alarm bells going off inside you. Don't become involved in spiritual activities that don't seem spiritually correct to you. Recently, a leader sent out a cautionary email about something that I think is important, and that is to be careful of casual laying on of hands. In fact, I mention the danger of this in my book, The Spirit of Excellence. People will go forward in many meetings to have something imparted to them by almost every visiting speaker. But in today's climate, we have to be careful not to have hands suddenly laid on us and spirits imparted that should not be imparted. Renounce out loud anything unquestionable that you may have received or from the occult, of course. But having said that, in revivals, unusual spiritual occurrences do happen. And so we need to be very sharp in our discernment. In addition to knowing well the scriptures and understanding God's ways, it's helpful to immerse ourselves in the accounts of past revivals and to read books about great moves of God that were led by consecrated men and women of God. Now, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit mentioned by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12.10 is called the discerning of spirits. This is the ability by the Holy Spirit to distinguish between different kinds of spirits, to know who is of God and who is not representing God. Notice the plural discerning of spirits. This is the gift from the Holy Spirit to be able to recognize and distinguish between different categories of spirits. To the natural eye, spirits are invisible, but they are even more real because they are eternal. Throughout the whole course of human history, individual lives have been influenced by spiritual forces. So we need to know what we're dealing with in the spiritual realm and to learn to discern them all. First of all, there is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Then according to Hebrews 1.14, there are also angelic spirits, which are sent by God to minister to believers. But then there are also wicked, evil spirits, which are fallen angels. And the Apostle Paul outlines their hierarchy in Ephesians chapter 6. These are all real, and they're all involved in the subject of discerning of spirits. In addition, there is, of course, the human spirit. A person can have a great spirit, a generous spirit, or a weak spirit, an evil spirit, and so forth. The human spirit can be unregenerate, or it can be born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, when by faith we believe in the Son of God and put our faith in Him as our Redeemer, in Jesus, Yeshua. When a person is truly born again and their spirit is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, there will be positive changes in their lives. Things are not going to remain the same. In fact, if there have never really been changes in your life. You could question whether God has ever come to dwell in you because it's inconceivable that the Holy Spirit indwells somebody and leaves them the same without any positive and wholesome changes. Even mature believers are still being refined and still being changed from glory to glory. So let's press into God for more of His Holy Spirit and be sure that you've invited Him in in the name of Jesus. Well, this is not the time to be despondent or damaged. The stakes are too high and the day is too dangerous. Are you bitter? Are you suffering? Are you angry at others? I learned that amongst the Jewish sages, there are multitudes of blessings for all sorts of situations. And I was blessed to read at the Hebrew for Christians website that there is also a blessing for deliverance. It goes like this. Blessed is the Lord who delivers us from self-destruction. We're warned not to destroy ourselves by allowing fear as well as bitterness or anger to consume our hearts. In the Torah, in Deuteronomy 7.26, we read, 
You shall not bring an abominable thing into your house and become devoted to destruction like it. The Jewish sages said that yielding to rage is equivalent to idol worship, and so rage should never be brought into your home. According to Ecclesiastes 7, 9, being quick to anger reveals foolishness within the heart. Indeed, rage is linked with idolatry because it exalts the ego. It claims that God can't or won't help you in your moment of testing or need. However, the scriptures affirm in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there is no test given to you that you cannot handle with God's help. And we're invited to come boldly before the throne of God to obtain mercy and to find help in our time of need. And he'll make an escape for us. If a person has received the Holy Spirit, we know that he is a believer. That's how in Acts chapter 10, Peter and the other Jewish visitors in the house of the Gentile centurion named Cornelius realized that Cornelius and his household were believers because they too received the Holy Spirit. Unbelievers cannot receive the Holy Spirit. The world just cannot receive Him. But the Holy Spirit is only for the children of God. Jesus is God's gift to the sinner, and the Holy Spirit is God's gift to the believer as well. And so if you have any questions or comments on this broadcast today, please feel free to share with me on social media. We also invite you to visit our website at exploits.tv. You can click online there to receive our weekly email, learn about our Holy Land teaching tours, and you can also watch all our video library 24-7. Don't forget also to download our free Jerusalem Channel app where you can view our videos as well. And please subscribe to our Jerusalem Channel YouTube site and my Substack. Until next time, I'll always be contending for the faith, praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Dark. Shalom and Maranatha. In my years of ministry in the Middle East, I've had deep spiritual conversations with many followers of Islam who shared with me one overriding experience. They all had at one time or another a dream or a vision about Jesus. And when they do, they have no doubt who he is or why he appeared to them. It's been my joy to document some of those heart-to-heart encounters of Jesus in the Muslim world in my book, Miracles Among Muslims, The Jesus Visions. This has been out of print since its first edition in 2006. But now, for the first time, we've made it available to read as an e-book. Check it out in the bookshop at Amazon website. And if you have a heart for the Muslim world, I believe this book will be an eye-opening encouragement and great blessing.